My question is related with the Harlem experiment. Uh, I mean, if the city is already segregated socially, it's highly probable that it's already segregated with prices. So my question is, how can we check that effect because they are moving to places which has more, high, I mean, it's expensive, the daily life, but it's also probable that they have higher wages because of that. So how to fix for purchase parity? My second brief thing is about the single mothers that one topic that is a high debate in some countries is about same-sex adopting child. So how can this be extended to give a, some point of view to that debate of how being adopted or not can help the children for that purpose? So on the, the first question, the first question, um, just to state it slightly differently, is how much of the difference in variation across areas can be explained by differences in cost of living, essentially, right? How much of this is actually a real difference in outcomes as opposed to nominal differences because of differences in prices? And so uh, let me give you a couple of different ways to approach that. So one thing we've done in our analysis, which I didn't show you here, is uh, replicate the entire analysis using uh, measures of income that are adjusted for local cost of living. And you find very similar patterns to what I showed you. And the reason for that is that we're fundamentally focused on upward mobility, that is the change in income across generations. And so when you apply a cost of living adjustment, that effect not, affects not just the child's earnings, as you pointed out, but because the parent is also living in the same area, ends up also affecting the parent's earnings in, in real terms. And so mobility is really measuring the difference between the child's earnings and the parent's earnings. And as a result, the difference between the two ends up being largely unaffected by adjustments for cost of living. So that's one way of thinking about it. A different way to see that cost of living is not fundamentally affecting what is not the key source of what's driving all this is if you look at outcomes that are not price driven, so for instance, the probability you have a teenage birth or the probability that you become a single parent or go to college, all of these, there's no natural price consideration, right? You see exactly the same type of spatial pattern. So while that could theoretically factor into it, we, we think empirically that's actually not what it is. On the second question of adoption, and how different family environments could affect uh, kids' outcomes. Am I getting it right that that's, that's what uh, you were asking about? That's a very interesting question. You know, I think um, uh, the, the, the work that I've shown you here doesn't directly speak to that. The, some of the best work I've seen on that topic is a very nice paper by Bruce Sasserdote at Dartmouth, which looks at the effects of um, family environment on adopted kids by basically using some quasi-random variation in the way adopted kids were assigned, kids from Korea were assigned to families in the US. And he shows that if by chance you were adopted by uh, parents who were more educated or more affluent, you have substantially better outcomes uh, if you're in a more stable family environment than, it, than, than if you uh, got a different set of parents. And so that's consistent with the view that being in sort of certain types of families can have positive impacts, but I think more work is necessary on those issues. So, so I noticed towards the end of um, the first lecture, you identify five correlates with social mobility after spending a long time identifying that neighborhood effects are a, a key determinant of social mobility. And I, I got the impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, of course, uh, that the correlates are more stylized facts that go on to motivate a deeper understanding in, in more specific studies of how, say, segregation might be an important determinant of um, social mobility. And I was wondering if there's, if, if you looked at or other people have looked at using the very large data set to more specifically identify whether or not those same correlates have causal effects and whether or not at the, at the biggest, most macro level, you could really pin down the relative importance of, of those? Yeah, uh, that's a difficult mm -hmm. question. So you, in order to really get at causal effects, as you saw from some of the studies I was describing here, you end up having to be more specific in terms of looking at something like the moving to opportunity, housing voucher subsidies, or the, the teacher study, which actually uses that study has been replicated in many other districts and has been kind of done at what you'd essentially consider a macro level. The, the much tougher question is, what is the causal contribution of each of those five, five factors or other factors to kind of the global picture? And 
given our current methodology, uh, I think the best we can do is try to go sequentially and understand what the causal mechanisms are behind each of these and then try to kind of aggregate. And as you could kind of see, we're able to document the correlations at the national level. We've taken a couple of steps towards identifying some of the causal pathways, but a number of items on that list remain to be explored in terms of identifying causal mechanisms. And so ultimately, I think one people's, once people do those specific studies, you might be able to bring it all together and in, into a single model and understand the relative contribution of all of these factors, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Thank you for your lecture. Um, so your questions are very ambitious and um, exciting, but I just got the impression that they don't rely strongly on economic theory to explain what we observe, say, when we're trying to, to, uh, to explain anything from individual optimization. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, it's because it's not feasible for questions of this scope, or it reflects a deeper disconnect between policy evaluation and uh, economic theory, and in that light, uh, I'm wondering what you think of the criticism by Deaton and uh, Hungus Deaton and James Heckman, uh, who criticize the uh, use of quasi experiments and like uh, randomized control trials and applied micro. Yeah, good questions. So, uh, um, so on the first question of theory, so you know, my view is that th this area, for example, has been an area with a lot of theoretical work in the past and relatively little empirical work. So, going back to, for instance, the classic work of Gary Becker on uh, intergenerational mobility and determinants of social mobility. I think what we've known less about is what, what are the patterns actually in the data in terms of how social mobility varies, what are the determinants of social mobility. So behind all of this, you know, why does one look at segregation? There's a long theoretical literature in both economics and sociology on why segregation might end up having an impact on economic outcomes. To think about the work on social capital, there's a long literature on human capital development that's underlying this type of work, at least implicitly. Now, so you know, I would say all of the empirical predictions we're testing, we don't look at those five factors kind of at random. There's obviously some theoretical logic underlying why you might be interested in that particular set of factors. So at that level, I think any such empirical analysis has to be guided by theory, where ultimately you'd like to use theory in a more precise way is maybe to make more specific predictions about exactly what will matter or estimate certain parameters of theoretical models. And that, I think, is, we're not, my view is this type of reduced form work is a first step along that agenda. Once we understand what the basic patterns are, there's potentially, you know, quite a bit of interesting work to be done in terms of estimating exactly what the rates of return to human capital look like, how does that relate to people's investment decisions, in the context of the housing stuff, I mentioned a bunch of issues about equilibrium, where clearly you're going to have to bring models to bear to think about what does sorting look like when you change these housing policies? How is that going to affect people's housing choices in a market equilibrium, where people might be optimizing, some people might be optimizing, some people might be making suboptimal decisions, but you still want to have some model of that behavior. And so I think ultimately, in dealing with those issues, you're going to want to have some bring in theory in a, in a, in a more uh, direct way. And then also in the context of the normative analysis of optimal policy. So for instance, how do you weigh issues of meritocracy versus social mobility when there's a trade-off between the two? Typically, you're going to need a theoretical framework to think about those normative problems. So again, I think it raises questions for theory. Um, and absolutely, I think there has to be an interchange between, uh, between the two. But the, in this particular topic, I think theory has been well ahead of the data for, uh, for a long time. Now, on the issue of quasi-experiments and, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I don't take the view that any one method is always correct or incorrect. For certain questions, some methods end up being useful. For other questions, other methods end up, end up being useful. And I think it's much more productive to come at the problem from what is the question you're trying to answer, what is the data you have available, and what are the best methods you can bring to bear on that problem, rather to classify yourself as I'm going to be an experimental economist or a quasi-experimental economist or a structural economist. 
That's the most diplomatic answer, at least. Um, so it's all well and good to say if we take one in a hundred people in a poor area and put them in a rich area, they're going to be well off. But what work's actually been done on improving outcomes in poor areas? Yeah, that's uh, so. Uh, yeah, I kind of tried to divide the, the current lecture into those two topics, right? So I mean, I think education is the most concrete thing in terms of people doing interventions in schools that have had dem clearly demonstrable effects. So in the context of teachers, or another good example is the work that Roland Fryer has done on the Harlem Children's Zone, which is uh, you know, low, a high poverty area. They've gone in and tried to fundamentally change schools and had really dramatic effects on students' long-term success. So education is one very well-defined area where people have made successful interventions. On the other dimensions, like some of the other correlates I talked about, uh, things like inequality or the social factors like family structure, it's less clear, as I was saying, how to manipulate those. And so it's really more of an open question. How can you try to change the structure of a community? Um, I don't have an, you know, concrete evidence to point you to in terms of policies that work. And that's not to say there aren't policies that would work. I think it's just that we don't know exactly what, what they would be. But that's clearly where we should be looking. Thank you, Professor, for an excellent paper. I, I find myself you know, very persuaded by your arguments. I, I wonder if you mind me asking a political question. Uh, I think you make a very persuasive argument for, for, for bringing people up out of poverty. I wonder, given the economic inequalities in America, whether you think the political desire is actually there to enable that to happen. And secondly, just a, an observation. Your presentation made me think about the global relationship of America and the decline this talk and the rest catching up and I find myself thinking very positively that maybe the, the rich neighborhoods don't need to worry about the poor kids moving into their areas. Yeah, um, yeah so on the, the, the question you asked about the political uh, interest in these issues. So what I find is that uh, inequality really divides people. So. People on the left of the political spectrum are quite concerned about inequality, and others, Republicans in the US, are, are less concerned about inequality and have very different views on what we should do. In contrast, social mobility and equality of opportunity, my experience has been um, you know, you, th there's an equal amount of interest on the two sides. So in terms of the politicians who I end up talking to, they're equally likely to be you know, President Obama as Congressman Paul Ryan, who's a Republican, or Jeb Bush, who's uh, one of the potential contenders for uh, the presidency on the Republican side in the next election. And you get an equal amount of interest from both sides because I think no one wants to at least come out in public with the view that uh, I don't think you know, kids from disadvantaged backgrounds should have a chance of moving up in the distribution if they, uh, if, if they work hard. And so equality of opportunity strikes me as a way to, in a, in a way, bridge the very controversial debate on inequality, it potentially tackle inequality in a way that brings people together as opposed to creates a divide. Um, hi, I wonder what your thoughts are on how one can use your findings um, to improve upward social mobility in a developing country. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So, you know, a lot of our research, as you've seen, focuses on countries, on developed countries, largely because that's where you have these types of data. Uh, but I think a lot of the ideas probably translate to developing countries as well. So certainly the ideas on schools, for example, and the importance of teachers, one would think intuitively would translate to developing countries. And there's been work demonstrating that in developing countries. And in some ways, the effects are even much more powerful. So in the US, we talk a lot about having a high value added teacher versus an average teacher. And that's what the debate's sort of about. Uh, in a country like India, there's some nice work that's been done by Karthik Murlidharan and Michael Kramer and others showing that a much more fundamental problem is just teacher absenteeism. The teacher doesn't even show up to teach the class. So that's not even anything as sophisticated as trying to compute the value added of the teacher. You can be pretty sure that there's no value added if the teacher is not there. And so uh, in a way, you have more low-hanging fruit in terms of potential policy changes that could, of these types that could that could end up having effects. And so my sense is that the potential returns are even greater in developing countries from thinking about these issues. And hopefully, going forward, we'll have data to study those countries uh, more directly. I think
we are at a time when we should uh, free our speaker. Um, <laughs> had uh, two full days and he's uh, yearning to go back to the other quiet of Cambridge. <laughs> so I'd like to thank Professor Chetty for a wonderful set of talks. Uh, I personally think they've been the most uh, uh, inspiring and stimulating and lectures that uh, I have enjoyed here in Cambridge for the last several years. These are big questions, there's big data, and there are big thoughts to, to ponder over. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience for being here, and I have just one final small thing left to do, which is to uh, just to hand over this little token of uh, gratitude to Professor Chetty for an excellent set of lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.